Hey everyone, I hope you are having an amazing day, night, evening, or whatever you're doing right now. Um, if you haven't already watched the video, I did just make a post about family systems and you can review that and then review this. Either way, it's fine. But today we're going to be going over groups, okay? Which is one of my favorite parts of the book is groups. I like groups. Um, you can use it with the purple book and the red book. Of course, I still like the purple book, but I also love the red book because it's very straight to the point. But the questions will come from the purple book and you can use the red book as a reinforcer for the information you're learning today. OK, so if you haven't already liked and subscribe, make sure you do that. OK, make sure you hit the notifications. I appreciate the people who have followed and subscribed. Thank you so much, so much. It means so much to me. Support the channel. Um, it helps spread the word and help more people get access to these quiz codes that you all have access to. So let's get right into it. Prior to the 1960s, most counseling took place in A, in a group setting, B, with the entire family present, C, in a dyadic relationship, D, in behavioral therapy clinics. So it's going to be C, in a dyadic relationship. A dyad is a unit of two functioning as a pair. In this case, the counselor and the counselee form the pair. Okay. So think of di, think of two. Okay. Let's go to the next one. A group has A, a membership which can be defined. B, some degree of unity and interaction. C, a shared purpose. Or D, all of the above. So I'll give about a five seconds between each one. And then we'll get the answer. No pressure, no pressure. <laughs> all right. B, all the above. Okay. So if you want to go back over the choices that we just went through. So a group has a membership, which can be defined. Like what kind of group is it? Okay. Um, some degree of unity interaction because you want to have coercion, right? Or cohesion, coercion. Said different ways, but you want to have unity, right? You want everyone to be able to feel like they can relate to each other. A shared purpose is like the outcome of the group, right? What are you learning in this group? What do you hope to get out of the group? The term group therapy was coined in 1931 by A. Frank Carson, the father of guidance, B. Jacob Marino, the father of psychodrama, C. E. G. Williamson, associated with the Minnesota Viewpoint, or D. Fritz Perls, the father of gestalt therapy. If you pick B, you are correct. So we're looking at the, the red book on page 152. The after term group therapy was coined in 1931 by psychiatrist Jacob Levy Moreno, who was born in 1889 and passed away in 1974. Moreno, you may call, along with his wife, Zocker T. Moreno, a psychotherapist, co-founded Psychodrama. In 1941, Marino credited the American Society Group for Psychotherapy and Psychodrama. One year later, Samuel Richard Slavison, a teacher, often abbreviated S.R. Slavison, founded the American Group Psychotherapy Association. Okay, just some little back history. And psychodrama, the term, Psychodrama techniques are appropriate for family therapy as well as group work. Okay. So psychodrama is when you play out the um, emotions and feelings that you have, right, via role playing. In 
In 1940s, in the 1940s, the two organizations for group therapy were created. A, the NASW and NBCC. B, ASG, WNAAS. C, the American Society for Group Psychotherapy and Psychodrama and the American Group Psychotherapy Association. D, AACD, and APA. Okay. All right, so it's going to be answer C. And if you don't know the abbreviations, the ASGW stands for Association for Specialists and Group Work. Okay, the MB, MBCC, right? National Board of Certified Counselors. Okay. The AAA stands for the American Association of Suicidology. And then the AA. The AACD. Right. Matter of fact, let me get that in my notes because it's not in the book. But if you chose that right answer, you are correct. And I'll get the information for the AACD in a second. But let's move on to the next one. Which theorist work has been classified as a preference to the group movement? A. Freud. B. John. C. Jesse B. Davis. And D. Adler. Also, while you're waiting, the AACD stands for Aging. Associated Cognitive Decline. Okay. Adler, okay. So Alfred Adler, he talked about birth order, right? Alfred Adler, he talked about organ inferiority. And he worked with children, right? He worked with a group of children. So Alfred Allen was actually engaged in group treatment during the 1920s at his child guidance facilities in Vienna. His rationale for group work was simply that man's problems and conflicts are recognized in their social, social nature. Let's go to the next one. Ooh, I think I gave you the answer for that one. Well, we're gonna rock with that one anyway. <laughs> All right, so hide answers, go back. Okay. All right, so primary groups are A, preventative, an attempt to ward off problems. B, always follow a person-centered paradigm. D, always focus on the client's childhood. And while we're waiting, Alpha Adler is individual psychology, okay? FYI. If you chose A, you are on the money. Okay, so primary groups are preventative groups and attempts to ward off problems. So the way that I remember primary groups versus secondary groups and then tertiary groups is that you think of primary groups are preventative, right? That P is preventative. And then you have secondary group is where you would have someone have symptoms of an issue that they, they're trying to manage, right, in everyday life. So say... If I had anxiety, I would go into a secondary group. If I had a primary group, 
I would be going to prevent anxiety. Then you have Titari Group, where I would literally need inpatient services because my anxiety is so bad that it's no longer manageable in the outside world, right? I can't prevent it. I can't cope with it. We're learning, you know, new coping skills and techniques. So now I have to go into inpatient because my anxiety is so bad that I need that more intensive help. So you think of going from primary, from secondary to tertiary, it's your symptoms are getting worse. Okay. And you experience in the tertiary group, you have that psychopathology, which is getting bad. Okay. A group is classified as secondary. This implies that A, it is preventive and attempts to ward off problems. B, a difficulty or disturbance is present. C, two therapists are utilized. And D, all the above. Yes, remember when I said that Secondary, there, it's already there. You can no longer prevent that. The anxiety, for example, is there, okay? When comparing a tertiary group with a primary or secondary group, A, a tertiary group focuses, on, focuses less on the individual members. B, the tertiary focuses more on the here and now. C, the tertiary is less likely to deal with severe psychopathology, and D, the tertiary is more likely to deal with severe pathology. Okay, and if you chose D, got it. Mm -hmm. Go back to the example that I made. Think of primary, secondary, Entire Think of P P S T. You want to? Okay. Group norms A exists in encounter groups. B exists only in career counseling groups. C are not related to group cohesiveness. And D govern acceptable behavior and group rules. So group norms govern acceptable behaviors and rules, right? You think of what's normal, social, what's acceptable inside of the group, right? So you think of the norm, what's expected. Group therapy initially flourished in the United States due to A, Freud's lectures in this country, B, a shortage of competent career counselors, C, a shortage of individual therapists during World War II. D, pressure from non-directed therapists pushing encounter groups. So C, a shortage of individual therapists during World War II. So during World War II, Many individuals were plagued with severe psychological problems, yet person personnel shortage made it impossible for each and every person to be treated using individual therapy. Jacob Marino had brought the idea of group therapy to the United States in 1925, but the supply and demand issues sparked by war were the catalyst which generated the idea whose time had come. Okay. Go to the next one. Group content refers to mater material discussed in group settings. Group processes refer to analysis of conscious, B, analysis of the ego, C, T group paradigm, D, the manner in which discussions and transactions occur.
the manner in which discussions and transactions occur. Groups, group content refers to what the group is discussing. Group process refers to analyzing the communications, interactions, and transactions. The process is the way in which the discussion takes place. Group cohesiveness refers to A, forces which tend to bind group members together, B, analysis of group content, C, a common co leadership style, D, a leadership style. So, A, forces which tend to bind group members together. Uh, think of group cohesiveness, another word you think of universality, right? Um, and you think of universality, it's good in groups because you don't feel like you're going through what you're going through alone and that you can relate to other people. Some theories feel that group therapy differs from group counseling, which is also called interpersonal problem-solving group. And that A, group counseling will be of longer duration. B, group therapy, also dubbed as a personality reconstruction group, will be of longer duration. C, group counseling requires far more training. And D, group therapy addresses a less disturbed population of clients. Okay, so B, therapy also dubbed as personality reconstruction in group will be of a longer duration. So let's go over this real quick. So if you think of group therapy and the difference between group counseling. So group counseling is when you work through everyday life stuff, right? Like ADLs, like money management, um, symptom management, right? Um, things that you learn in the group, you take it onto the outside world, right? So group therapy is more intense because you're working through, uh, like this says, like, you know, personality issues and concerns, right? So group therapy can take place in a facility, okay? So the difference is, is that group counseling is more so for basic ADL life skills. And then group therapy is more of the unconsciousness part of dealing with personality trait issues and so forth. Most experts would agree that overall, A, structured exercises are more effective than unstructured techniques. B, structured exercises are less effective than unstructured techniques. C, all well-trained therapists favor structured exercises over unstructured exercises and techniques. D, ethical guidelines for must forbid unstructured techniques because they can be dangerous to the depressed or anxious client. So, B, structured exercises are less effective than unstructured. So, one of the reasons for this is that when you are running a group, you want the group to feel they have a say, right? If you think about the different kind of group leaders, you have the authoritarian is the more structured, like they have a itinerary for every minute of the group, right? The group leaders, I mean, the group members do not have any say in anything. You think of the democratic, democratic is a bit of both, right? They lead, but they also allow other people in the group to lead and to run the meeting, right? Because you have the need for them to feel like they're making decisions. You give them some power, um, you allow them that freeway. Last year, also known, I say lazy, is someone who just lets the group run itself. So what the powerful most experts would agree is that when you have unstructured groups, it still allows the groups to be able to take part of the discussion, be more involved, um, also allow for more cohesiveness and universality. One advantage of group work is that the counselor can see more clients in a given period of time. One disadvantage is that a counselor can be too focused on group processes and A, thus individual issues are not properly examined. B, the group 
becomes too behavioristic, C, A, and B, or D, thus the group focuses on too much content. One advantage of group work, right? This question is A, thus individual issues are not properly examined. So we go back to that group counseling, right? Group counseling is where you just talk about basic ADL skills. You don't dive into like personality issues or unconsciousness, um, like deep dive, right? That would be more so with group therapy. According to the risky shift phenomenon, a group decision will A, be less conservative than the average group member's decision prior to the group's discussion, B, be more conservative than the average member's decision prior to the group's discussion. C, often be aggressive or illegal. D, violate the group's confidentiality norms. Ooh, I was struggling with that word. All right, let's see what you got. Be less conservative than the average group member's decision prior to the group's discussion. Okay. So when you think of the risky shift, right? So the risky shift phenomenon is the behavior of your wild and crazy teenager peer group, for example. Uh, the risky shift phenomenon dispels the group popular notion that groups are very conservative. Some neuro research indicates that the group behavior is not necessarily more risky, but does at least shift more towards the social norm than the individual discussion made prior to the group participants. Okay. The group often stress ways employees can express themselves in an effective manner. The T and T groups merely stands for A, techniques, B, taxonomy, C, training, D, testing. Training, okay. Um, I, highlighted this, I highlighted this word because you want to look at the keywords in a sentence. So ways employees can express themselves. So it has to be some sort of training, right? Maybe it's assertiveness training. Uh, maybe it's communication training, right? So you think of anytime you see employees um, and you see T groups, those two are together, okay? So word is training groups. A counselor suggests that her client can join an assertiveness training group. Most assertiveness training groups are A, unstructured, B, psychodynamic or person-centered, C, focused heavily on existential concerns, D, behavioristic and highly structured. We are going to go with behavioristic and highly structured because we're going to do that because assertiveness training is a behavior. You have to show assertiveness, right? Verbally and how you like your posture, et cetera, right? And it's going to be structured because it's going to have the, what you need to do from A through Z. It will have all the things you need to know, right? It's not going to be an open group about it. Per se, it's going to be structured because it has a detailed itinerary of how to show assertiveness. Wave Watchers is a A, T group, also called training group, B, self-help or support group as an AA, C, psychotherapy group, and D, marathon group. So Wave Watchers is a self-help group, right? Because just like an AA group, you're getting help and support in managing something 
whether it's for the AA group, it's alcohol, so, you know, sustaining from that. And then Weight Watchers is keeping the weight off. ACA and the ASGW division recommend screening for potential group members. A, for all groups. B, only when a group is in a hospital inpatient setting. C, only when the group is composed of minors. And D, only if the group deals with chemical dependency. Okay, for all groups, right? Um, you want to have training for all groups that you can. And we'll talk more about groups when it comes to open and closed groups as well and how it varies and it's different. But the ACA and the ASGW would want you to have a screening. Uh, screening is easy enough to define. The professional counselor uses a screening process in order to determine who is appropriate and who will not be appropriate for the given group. A counselor is conducting screening for clients who wish to participate in a counseling group, which will meet Tuesday nights at his private practice office. Which client would most likely be the poorest choice for a group member? A, a shy librarian. B, an anxious salesman, salesman with no group experience. C, extremely hostile and belligerent construction worker. D, a student with 16 hours towards her MEB counseling. In counseling. I'm hoping you pick C. If you did, yes. <laughs> you would not want someone who's very hostile, extremely hostile like that, belligerent. That that group will not do well. Okay. You don't want that in your group. A counselor is screening a client for a new group at a college counseling center. Which client would most likely be the poorest choice for a group member? A, a first year student who's suicidal and sociopathic. B, a second year student who stutters. A, or C, a graduate student with a facial tick. D, a fourth year student with OCD tendencies. Here we go. Yep. A, don't want this in your group. I can name a couple of reasons why. Okay. A screening for group members can be done in a group or privately. Although private screenings interviews are not as cost effective or time efficient, many group leaders feel they are superior in much as private screening sessions. So if you want to sum this up in a better way, private practice screenings have been dubbed as superior uh, for some than the group, group screenings. Okay. So this is asking you why does the private practice screenings feel they are superior? It's because A, intensifies transference, B, encourage catharsis, C, intensify operation, D, generally superior in terms of counselor and client interaction. Okay, so D, superior in terms of counselor and client interaction. So when you think of private, pri private group screenings, they are closed group, right? If you think of a private closed group, no one comes in and people can leave once the group starts. When you think of a private practice as well, you'll have that one-to-one -one conversation, so you build that relationship. But when you have a group, when it's an open group, for sure, then you have more people coming in and out whenever. You might have, you would have a screening in the beginning, but those same members could leave and new members can enter without a screening. Most experts in the field of group counseling would agree that most important trait for group members is the ability to, A, open up, B, to listen, C, to trust, D, to convey empathy.
okay, to trust, right? Because if they don't trust you, how are they going to open up? How are they going to listen? And how are they going to, you know, if they do convey empathy, right? Being able to trust and feel secure and know that the group is confidential will allow someone at most to feel confident in doing so. Group can be open or closed. The two differ in that A, open groups are limited to hospital settings. B, in a group, in an open group, members can socialize between group meetings. C, groups always employ co-leaders. And D, groups allow no, closed groups allow no new members after the group begins. So groups can be open or closed. How they differ? I talked a little bit about this, so if you remember, you got it. I don't know why this shows up, but okay. All right. Okay, so if you chose D, host groups allow no new members after the group begins, right? I talked a little bit about this and about how the screenings are for private are do allow for there to be like a close relationship between the counselor and the group members because you have that private screening and no one can go in after the group start. One major advantage of closed group versus an open group is A, cost effectiveness. B, it promotes cohesiveness. C, it lessens counselors' burnout. D, it allows the members to meet less frequently. So B, it pro promotes cohesiveness. And we talked about this too, how it does that because you have the same group members coming into the, the private or the closed group, right? You don't have new members like an open group coming in and out, in and out, who might not have been there for the first, second, third, or fourth session to build that cohesiveness with people who've been there in the beginning, okay? One major disadvantage of closed groups versus an open group is that, A, if everyone quits, you'll be left with no group members. B, closed groups cannot provide depth therapy. C, it promotes paranoid feelings in group members. And D, closed groups are much more structured. So here we go, A, right? Closed groups, once the group starts, no one else can enter, but people can leave. So if everyone leaves the group and the closed group, guess what? You have no group. The number of people in an open group is generally, A, more stable than in a closed group, B, much smaller after, after an extended period of time than in a closed group, C, significantly larger than a closed group, and D, more dependent on the group leader's marketing skills than in a closed group. So A, more stable than in a closed group. So going back to open group, open group, people could come in and it fluctuates how many people come in and out, right? But it's someone in the group at times, right? If you have, like I said before, if you have a close group, you don't have that in and out of members. Once your members leave, that's it. You don't have someone to replace that in a closed group. One distinct disadvantage of an open group is that A, new members are not accepted after the first meeting. B, the leader does not control the screening process. C, a member who begins after the first meeting has missed information or experiences. And D, the group is generally too behavioristic for that therapy to occur. C, a member who begins after the first meeting has missed information or experiences. 
and I mentioned this before too, right? Open groups, people can come in and out. You can come in in the beginning, middle, end of the group. So they miss out on pertinent information, which also lessens cohesiveness. When a group member is speaking, it is best for the counselor to A, try to face the group member, B, not face the group member, as this does not appear genuine in a group setting, C, smile while listening, and D, suppress genuine emotion. Okay, so A, try to face a group member, right? So you want to be attentive. Body language is huge in uh, how clients can see if you're paying attention or not, right? Because we are both not just, you know, verbal and physical. Most of our communication is nonverbal. So if you smile while listening, you know, some people can take that as being condescending or smirking, right? Suppress genuine emotion. You want to be genuine. Um, but sometimes, you know, it can come off as not being genuine. So you just want to be careful about that in groups, okay? Especially if you have like a strong reaction. A group setting has a flexible seating arrangement in which clients are free to sit wherever they wish. In this setting, it is likely that A, an African-American client and a Caucasian leader would sit close together. B, a Hispanic client and African-American leader would sit close together. C, an Asian-American client and an African-American leader would sit close together. Or D, an Asian-American leader and an Asian-American client would sit close together. So D, an Asian American leader and an Asian American client who will sit close together. Okay. Generally, persons who are similar will sit next to each other. In this case, choice D is the only one that mentions two persons of the same race. We will leave it at that. A group setting has a flexible seating arrangement in which clients are free to sit wherever they wish. In this setting, it is likely that a, a male leader in a designer suit and a female client in cutoff jeans will sit close together. B, a Hispanic male leader in a designer suit and an Asian male client in another brand of designer suit will sit close together. C, a Caucasian female leader in a designer outfit and a Caucasian male in a pair of old jeans and an undershirt will sit close together. D, a male leader in a designer suit and a female client in a jogging suit and old tennis shoes with holes in them will sit close together. And if you chose B, you are correct, right? So the issue, the thing here is not race, it's your clothing, right? Designer suit. Another person with a designer suits. So you have that in common. Oh, sorry about that. It's my voice thing. Which statement made by a doctoral level counselor is illustrative of a leader focused on process rather than product? So I want you to keep in mind about process. Process is the thought process, how we are comprehending or registering what we heard or seen. The product is the physical aspect of that response to that stimuli that we can physically see. So process is mental, product is physical. So A, Jim seems more relaxed today. B, Sally seems a bit self-critical this evening. C, I hear a lot of sadness in Betty's voice. D, you wince whenever Jane raises her voice. So you're trying to see which one focuses on process rather than product. Okay. 
Yes. You went whenever Jane raised her voice, right? The voice is raised. Jane winces or process, right? Um, so that's what you're looking at. You're looking at the process. Wincing is how she was processing that. Which statement made by a group leader in a residential center for adolescents focused on products rather than process? A, Ken has not stolen for a week and thus is eligible for a supplementary tokens. B, and Karen looks down when Bill discusses relationships. C, it sounds like there's a deep sense of hurt. D, oh, so you fold your arms and sort of close up when Karen mentions the angry side of your personality. So here we focus, let's focus on product rather than process. Okay, so if you chose A, you are correct, right? So product is the physical, the physical response, right? The physical, you know, what we can measure, right? And the tokens, we don't know what that, was as far as a process as to why Ken did not decide to stay, but we know he got that token, right? So that's that product. Group norms promote the concept of universality, which suggests that A, we are unique and so are our problems. B, there is universal way to solve nearly any difficulty. C, A, and B, and D, we are not the only ones in the world with a given problem. Okay, so I had spoke about this too, about universality, that we are not the only ones in the world with a given problem. This builds cohesiveness in groups to so feel like they're not alone, they're not the only one experiencing what they're going through. In the late 1930s, researchers identified three basic leadership styles. A, directive, non-directive, and semi-passive. B, autocratic, authoritarian, democratic, laissez fair. C, relaxed, anxious, intense. And D, assertive, non-aggressive, and aggressive. You pick B, you're right. Yep. The autocratic or authoritarian leader may be given orders to the group, while the lazy, fair leader, A, assigns a group members as an authoritarian, B, has a hands-off policy and participates very little, C, has the most desirable style of leadership, and D, nearly always run open-ended groups. All right, B, right? So they're very hands-off. Remember I said laissez, laissez, um, you think of lazy, right? That's how I remember it. They do very, very, very little. When well, comparing the autocratic and democratic and laissez faire styles, the autocratic is more desirable. The laissez faire is the most desirable. Democratic is the most desirable. And D, there is no discernible differences in effectiveness. Democratic, right? Democratic is most desirable because you have someone who is hands on but allows the group to lead to. That allows them to participate. A group with more than one leader is said to utilize co-leaders. Co-leaders is desirable because A, the group can go on even if one leader is absent. B, two leaders can focus on group dynamics better than one leader. And C, leaders can process their feelings between sessions. 
and D, all the above. Okay. All the above. Those are all the, the benefits of having a co-lead in the group. Co-leadership, A, reduces burnout and helps ensure safety. B, increases burnout. C, has no impact on burnout. Or D, should not be used for open groups. A, reduces burnout and helps ensure the safety of the group. Right, because you have one person who's taking over. Uh, maybe you need a break or you've chimed in. And, you know, you support each other, right? Co-leadership also refers to co-facilitation. Can be a disadvantage when, A, leaders are working against each other and this can fragment the group. B, leaders are intimate with each other. C, leaders question each other's competence. Or D, all the above. All the above. Both leaders are apt to work at cross purposes when. And cross purposes is another word for conflict. They don't have the same purpose of the group or outcome of the group, right? Their point of view is different in regards to the group. A, they do not meet between group sessions. B, they do not meet between group sessions. That looks like that's the, okay. They do not meet between group sessions, A. B, they do meet between group sessions. C, they are master level practitioners. And D, they are doctoral level practitioners. So A, they do not meet between group sessions. So if you have people who are leaving, colleagues who are in the group, and they're not discussing anything that's happening within the groups, then one person might think the group is going well. Another person might think it's a hot mess. So it's good to, you know, rejoin, gather, and talk about how the group is going and any, anything that needs to be noticed or changed. Gerald Corey, who has written extensively on group therapy, believes blank is necessary for an effective group leader. A, a master's degree in guidance and counseling. B, a doctorate in counseling education. C, participation in therapeutic group and participation in leaders group. D, three credit hours in graduate course and in group, ther in group ther theory. Oh my goodness, I'm struggling tonight. Um, so let's read the again. <laughs> three credit hours in graduate courses in group theory. All right. That's why I'm just getting over having COVID and bronchitis um, last week. So bear with me. So it is important for a therapist, whether they're, you know, they're newly graduated or anything like that, is to get continuous trainings to know what methods are important and helpful in group dynamics. Most experts would agree that an effective adult counseling group has blank members, A, nine to 12, B, three to five, C, 11 to 16, D, five, six to eight members. So D, five or six to eight members, right? Now I've heard, of course, and I've seen more members in, in a group, right? So when you have more members in the group, then you would have a co-leader, it would be ideal to help manage the group. So an ideal group will have about eight adults 
an adolescent group might be slightly smaller, perhaps five to six members. Okay. Some experts feel that a group conducted over a long period of time can safely have as many as 10 members. Co-leaders are apt to work at cross purposes when, ta-da, it's the same question. Let's see if you remember the answer from last time and why is the answer? Most experts would agree that an effective counseling group for children has A, more members than an adult group, B, less members than an adult group, C, at least two group leaders, and D, nine to 12 members. Okay, less than the of an adult group, right? Kids are gonna have less attention, attention span you know, so it's good to have three to four children is usually recommended versus about eight people in an adult group. And also kids can get distracted. So you want to make sure you have less distraction as possible. And sometimes that just means having a smaller group. Although the length of group counseling sessions will vary, most experts would agree that blank is plenty of time when critical issues are being examined. A, three hours per session. B, one hour per session, C, six hours per session, and D, two hours per session. So yeah, two hours a session, right? It's uh, I did my internship practicum and groups were just about 45 minutes to an hour. Whether you think about critical issues are being examined, it can run a little longer than that. Okay. One and a half to two hours is sufficient for adult group work. Longer groups often beget fatigue in the group members. With children, the group leader should note that the member's attention span, which is generally shorter for adults, shorter than adults. Okay. In terms of group risk, an ethical leader will discuss them during the initial session with the client. An ethical leader should never discuss risk with a client. Research, C, research has demonstrated that less say about the, them, the better the group will interact. D, an ethical leader allows the group to discover risk and work through them in their own pace. Okay. So you want to tell them that during the initial session with the client. Okay, you tell them that during the screening. So they can have a decision, which is autonomy, right? Free will. And an adapt group leader, and that's just another word for skilled or adapt um, or adapt group leader. Um, an attempt to safeguard clients against risk. B, work to reduce risk and dangers. C, A and B. D, let the group handle the dangers on their own. So it's A and B, right? A skilled group leader will attempt to safeguard, right? Duty, duty to no harm, right? Uh, work to reduce risk and dangers. A group participant wants to drop out of a group. Since the group is closed, ASGW ethics state that A, the group leader must insist that the client stay. B, the client must be allowed to withdraw. C, the leader should allow the other members to put pressure on the participants to stay, and D, A, and C. Okay. I am hoping you pick B, right? We cannot hold people there to be in the groups. Can't force them to stay. We can tell them the benefits of the group and so forth, but we cannot make people in the group stay. So I have to be mindful of that. Usually I stop at 50, but I'll do it. I'll stop at 51 today. During the initial session of a group, the leader explains that no smoking, no cursing will be permitted. This is known as A, setting ground rules, B, ambivalent transference, C, blocking, D, scapegoating. A, 
A, setting ground rules, okay? That's like the group norms that we talked about earlier, okay? So I hope this session has been good at just clarifying things, picking out some keywords, um, just looking at how the question's being asked, and leave a comment on the next uh, chapter you want me to do. So have a couple of like research assessments, careers, and so forth. So let me know what you think. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe and like and hit the notifications as I'll be doing videos uh, at least once or twice a week. So thank you again and have a great, amazing night.